The world has gone to crap, hasn't it? Well, I mean, not entirely to crap, though. Civilization as we know it is done, for sure. But there's still a glimmer of hope for the rest of humanity. And if you were charged with this glimmer, what would you do to preserve it? Would you dull it to help prepare it for the harsh reality of the world? Or would you let it shine, as it should, like a beacon? It's not an easy question to grapple with, but The Walking Dead lets you do so. And you may find yourself with a bigger heart at the end of it than you may think. Humanity is a precious thing, more precious than we give it credit for, and it doesn't take much for it to erode away. That theme is prevalent throughout basically the entire Walking Dead franchise, from comics to shows to games. Hell, Chuck paraphrases that famous poem about the preciousness of humanity late in this game. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. It does not take Lee, our main character, long to meet the game's heart and soul, its avatar for humanity's future, Clementine. Clementine is present for every single choice the player makes, which, if I may say so, makes this game's moral choices a hell of a lot more effective, because you're not thinking about yourself, and you're not thinking about some quantifiable meter. You're thinking of Clem, and the game doesn't hesitate to remind you of this. It's a stark contrast between the harshness of the zombie apocalypse and the joy and hope of raising Clementine. Not just protecting her, raising her. Guiding her to be the best kind of person she can be. And the fact that you're the one making those choices makes it more impactful. It reveals to you what it means to you to raise a child, and what you think of humanity is worth preserving. That's why this game shows you those statistics at the end of every episode. It's to show and reassure you that you're not alone, and also to show you what other players value in this kind of setting. It's telling that in this game, the majority of players value making honest and compassionate choices, and that the game is not afraid to show you that. That's not to say that the game isn't bleak, of course, it is. For every choice that's made easier by a child's presence, there's another where the morality isn't that easy, even with that small moral credo guiding you along. The Walking Dead is a game that challenges your morality, but also has faith in it. Lee starts the game as a criminal, after all. His journey to acceptance and trustworthiness is long, and not everyone stays along for it. But by the end, it's Lee, a man who literally started the adventure in the back of a police car, who is able to keep Clementine safe and keep her hopeful for the future. The dude goes from beating another man to death for sleeping with his wife to literally dying for a child. And remember, Clem is our avatar for humanity. Clementine is hope, and Lee dies for that. Help not just Lee, everyone. Everyone in the group has a hand in raising Clem, however small, and a lot of them are willing to die for it by the end. A powerful thing, that. Trusting a child that you've only known for a small amount of time to preserve what's best about humanity. It's a beautiful thing that the game trusts us with. Keeping hope alive. Keeping it alive. Wait. <sighs> the world has really gone to crap, hasn't it? And I do mean crap. Civilization as we know it is done, for sure. You know what a guy has to do just to live in the world of The Last of Us? Quarantine zones are oppressive, and the world outside is even worse. Unfathomable horrors wait for us just outside the gates. It's kill or be killed out there, and hope is impossible. Everyone is awful, and there's only one person in the post-apocalypse that truly matters. Me. Right? Joel is trapped in a world of suffering and contempt. 
His daughter died decades ago. He lives in a dystopian nightmare governed by people who don't know what they're doing, and he smuggles weapons for a living. Let's put a pin in that and talk about zombies. Most of the time, in stories, zombies are used more as a catalyst for storytelling than any kind of in-depth science fiction or fantasy concept. Generally, how one becomes a zombie is not as important as how a character or setting reacts to zombies. For some stories, zombies are a new lease on life. For others, zombies bring out the best or worst in humanity. And sometimes it's just an excuse to shoot a bunch of mindless corpses with friends. But the zombies in The Last of Us are an in-depth science fiction concept. We spend a hell of a lot of time around these zombies, learning about how the plague spreads, learning about how they evolve and die in horrifying detail. So why even bring that kind of thing up? Clearly the mechanics and nitty-gritty lore of zombiehood shouldn't be that important to a game's themes, right? Well, it's hard to ignore in this case, because the game's entire plot is designed around it. The main quest, the mission that our main character Joel is on, is to escort an immune teenager across the country so that people can find a cure to the zombie infection. The details and mechanics of the zombies in The Last of Us are baked right into the story, because they represent hope. The characters in The Last of Us are motivated by a desire to restore civilization to the way it was. They place a hell of a lot of stock in the science of zombies as the hope for the future and it explodes in their faces, literally, because Joel's attachment for Ellie is too strong to let her sacrifice herself for humanity's sake. L let's repeat that and process that. The power of love dooms humanity. That's a hell of an ending thematic statement. But is it love though? Because while Joel loves Ellie enough to rescue her from the Fireflies, he doesn't value her self-agency enough to be honest with her about why he did it. And Ellie knows, or at least she has a hunch, that she's being lied to. Joel may have grown attached to Ellie, but it seems to be a toxic attachment. Let's unpin that harsh world thing that we had pinned earlier. Joel is a bad person, undoubtedly. In the 20 years after his daughter's death, he has grown into a man with little regard for human life, who values his own survival as paramount above most things. That's why he holds so much contempt towards Ellie at the beginning. Ellie is a burden who asks too many questions and does a bunch of stupid crap on her own. Or at least, that's what Joel thinks of her. Together, the two of them go through hell, and they do end up screwing a lot of people over. Tess, Bill, the Hunters, Elliot and Sam, David and his community, a lot of people. And some of those people did deserve it, without a doubt. David is a monster, and so are the people he lives with. It is a crappy world, and Joel and Ellie only make it more crappy. But it's all okay. It's all worth it to get to the end and come up with a cure- oh. Right. See, but Joel wasn't always a bad person, and you can see where he's coming from at the end, as selfish as his actions are. Joel is just a person, and the world destroyed him just like it did everyone else. Just like it did to Ellie, taking away from her the one person who understood her the most for no other reason than it could. And the world makes them who they are. The world has them kill or be killed. It's robbed them of their humanity. And then finally, a door opens. We have an out, a cure, a way to return to the way things were, to undo the badness of the world, and Joel slams the door in humanity's face. Is this world doomed? It seems trapped in a cycle of brokenness and toxicity that is impossible to escape until it just quietly snuffs itself out. Some of you may have been trapped in situations like this. It's abuse. The world of The Last of Us is abused and stuck in a toxic situation that is difficult, if not impossible, to escape. We don't get any say in how this story unfolds. If you refuse to shoot the surgeon at the end, the game will flat out refuse to continue until you do. And sometimes the game throws a hissy fit if you don't do things exactly as the game expects you to. It's a Naughty Dog game, and that's a flaw with a lot of Naughty Dog's recent games. But for The Last of Us, it works to the game's advantage. It lets us disconnect from the game's world and think about it without feeling as toxic and hopeless as the characters do. There is one character in this game that does shine as a ray of hope. We only meet her at the beginning, before everything goes to crap. It's Sarah. Sarah still lives in our world, a more civilized and dignified world where kill or be killed isn't the norm. She laughs and jokes and loves wholesomely. 
She lives in a world that could go to hell, but doesn't necessarily need to yet. And it's no coincidence that she's among the first to die. Sarah is the last of us. Naughty Dog is obviously still going strong. Sony has given them a rather large financial security net, and it never seems like they're hurting for resources. Their games often set graphical benchmarks despite never really being on the most powerful hardware out there. The Last of Us was big. Not like Fortnite big, but still big enough to affect how the video game playing public sees lavish, big-budget artistic games, which are something that Sony values a hell of a lot. Just humor me here. We're getting into console war discourse. If you look at big console exclusives, Microsoft tends to focus on blockbusters, Nintendo tends to focus on fun and interactivity, and bless them for it, but Sony... Sony focuses on class. They like to craft their console's image as one of prestige. Yes, a PS4 can play Fortnite or Call of Duty with the best of them, but it's only on PlayStation that you get lavish, high-class, story-driven art like The Last of Us, or Shadow of the Colossus, or God of War. And those of you who have ever thought about movies that come out late in the year probably have a word for this. It's Oscar bait. Sony really likes Oscar bait. Now, that's not a bad thing, duh. I'd rather live in a world with prestigious, thoughtful, single-player adventures than one with manipulative microtransactions and feedback loops. Hell, I've already made a Favorite Games Project video on Shadow of the Colossus, and I still love that game to bits. But it does make me think. The Last of Us came out right after Telltale's Walking Dead, and also right after Bioshock Infinite, all of which are games about a father figure killing a lot of zombies slash people slash both for the sake of protecting a daughter figure. And yes, I did read Matty Bryce's The Dadification of Games piece too, and I'm going to try not to just straight up parrot it here. These releases sort of painted the image of an aging gaming audience wanting enriching and soulful games while still eating their violence cake. But I think that The Last of Us is an interesting, if maybe not entirely intentional, takedown of that. It forces its audience to reckon with the sheer brutality of its world and its violence. As stated earlier, it deconstructs the idea that you can have a soulfully enriching game while still enjoying the violent shootouts that the medium was known for at the time, and still kind of is. The Last of Us isn't a fun game, and loving selflessness comes a hell of a lot harder to someone who's been in a traumatic situation than to someone who is comfortably controlling that character from their living room. That's why the game doesn't give you a choice at the end. That's why it doesn't give you any narrative choices. And that's why the game is as brutal and controlling as it is. But that also begs the question, should a creative work be bleak for bleakness' sake? What good is a depressing story if the only purpose is to depress? What is an apocalypse without a glimmer of hope? Glimmer of hope? Wait. <laughs> Telltale Games is obviously not around anymore. The factors leading up to their demise were numerous. The financial and critical success of The Walking Dead was unlike anything Telltale had experienced with any of their other games, and Telltale rushed to make similar games under a bevy of different intellectual properties. Their games came out fast, and they came out rushed. Working conditions were brutal, their in-house engine was woefully out of date, and they kept signing unrealistic contracts and business deals right up until the day they suddenly and unexpectedly closed their doors. That isn't to say that everything they made after The Walking Dead wasn't good, of course. In fact, I'd argue that their spin on Batman was one of the most daring and interesting takes on that property, especially in the second season. But that doesn't excuse what they did to their employees. The few gems they did produce in that time from 2013 through 2018 were drowned in a sea of mediocre games, crammed out by a tired and exhausted workforce. And this was after two of the writers of The Walking Dead left to form their own studio. It's kind of tragically ironic. Telltale was destroyed by the very thing The Walking Dead thematically wasn't. Telltale's working conditions reflected a lack of empathy in humanity. And what do we take away from that? I mean, aside from the obvious how not to run your studio into the ground. Because there is something to be appreciated from the Telltale structure. It helps players explore their own empathy towards other characters in interesting and non-quantifiable ways. 
Hell, Enemy Within lets you empathize with the Joker, the freaking Joker, to the point where he can almost become a hero. Almost. Even Joaquin Phoenix couldn't pull that off. And that's to say nothing of other studios that have borrowed from Telltale's playbook. Life is Strange and Until Dawn definitely wouldn't exist in a world without The Walking Dead. And Telltale's demise was one catalyst, on top of stories from Epic and Bioware, for getting developers and the game-buying public thinking seriously about unionization and the rights of people who work on games. And that's a needed thing that is past due talking about. So yes, the world is dark and bleak. Sometimes overwhelmingly so. But that doesn't mean there's no room for hope. Or no room for improvement. But rather that, in a grim world, we make our own hope.